30 years is a long time to hold on to a dream. When Wellington Mara's Giants defeated the Broncos in Super Bowl XXI, quarterback Phil Simms was 30 years old. And 30 years was how long it had been since the Giants had last won a championship. Bill Parcells was just a teenager then, living in Hasbrook Heights, New Jersey. I was always a Giant fan as a youngster. My exposure to professional football was the New York Giants. And so my heroes were the players that were playing. I remember hearing them lose this championship game in 58 on the radio. Alan Amici has heard the touchdown, and the Baltimore Colts are the professional football champions of the world. All my friends were ice skating out on Lake Apatcon in New Jersey, and I'm sitting in the car listening to the game, and they're all out there having a good time. And uh, I remember how sad I felt after it was over. So that was always in my heart, my, my team, that I had a special feeling for. The team Parcells called his own would move into a stadium, a five-minute drive from his hometown. The Giants hoped their new surroundings would produce a winner. Instead, they constructed new ways to lose. Under 30 seconds left in the game. From here on in, Pizarczyk can just fall on the football and there is nothing the Eagles can do. And Pizarczyk fumbles the football. It's picked up by Herman Edwards. I do not believe what has occurred here, ladies and gentlemen. After the most shocking loss in franchise history, the Giants tried to reverse their fortunes with a change in direction at quarterback. I'll never forget when Ray Perkins told me about a week before the draft. He says, now, if you're there at number seven, we're going to pick you. And I remember telling all my friends, that'll make the people of New York really happy. New York Giants first round selection. Quarterback Phil Simms, Moorhead State. Two years after selecting an unknown quarterback from Kentucky, the Giants drafted highly touted linebacker, Lawrence Taylor. Parcells became the team's linebacker coach and defensive coordinator. Together, Parcells and Taylor would transform one of the league's worst defenses into one of the best. Be more aggressive on that special now. They'll come back with that. You know that slant counter there? Yeah. Kick it over. Show how to play that. Bill knows a lot about football, and I'm in love with his football philosophy. That's, that's what that really sets Bill apart from a lot of coaches is, is that football philosophy. He, he sees things, and, and he can and envisions things, and, 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 and he knows how to let his players play, you know? Hey, the, you know, the hell with all, this, all the stupid stuff. You know, just let your players play. Taylor had great respect for Parcells but thought little of the team's fair-haired quarterback. I very seldom talked to him. I didn't really want to talk to him. As I saw it, he was one of the guys you see on TV that drank tea with the pinky up, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. The perception that Sims wasn't tough enough began to bear out on the field. Three years in a row, he suffered season-ending injuries. Parcells was named head coach in 1983. His first big decision was whether to keep starting the injury-prone Sims or go with Scott Bruner. I go in and sit down in this room, and there's a desk in between the two of us. And you know, I'm thinking he's going to ask me a few questions. We're going to talk. I, before I can really even sit in the chair, he goes, Phil, we've decided to go with Scott. You're the second quarterback. You got any problems with that? And, uh, wow. So I go, yeah, I got a lot of problems with it. And I said things to Bill that day that it's amazing our relationship ever had a chance. I said, look, Bill, I can't play for you. You got to trade me. He goes, well, I'm going to trade you then. Well, all I can say to that whole thing is thank God it didn't work out. The front office refused to trade Sims, and Parcells stuck with Bruner as his quarterback. That was a mistake, but I made it almost paid for it dearly. The 
team finished with just three wins, and rumors circulated that Parcells would be fired. Jimmy, the New York Giants are in the midst of a pathetic season. What about Coach Bill Parcells? Is he secure for next year? Parcells inherited quarterback problems. He inherited bad drafting. Now the Giants are looking to get rid of him, Grant. I'll never forget Bill Parcell saying to me in the weight room that offseason, he goes, Sims, if I survive this, trust me, we're going to do it my way. In 1984, Parcells did return. He replaced nearly half the roster and named Sims his starting quarterback. Sims threw for over 4,000 yards, and the Giants made the playoffs. The foundation for success was now in place. The Giants were finally in a position to end their championship drought. In 1985, the Giants reached the divisional playoffs, where they faced the 15-1 and Chicago Bears. An honest evaluation of it, we could, we could have probably beaten them maybe one out of ten times. But that day was one of the days that that could have happened. The Giants landed several big hits, but were ultimately undone by a miss. Landetta from his end zone. Bears look at good field position. Oh, he missed it! This is the football! He missed it! It's inside the field! Oh. Right. It's Sean Gale! And after the game was over, we're in the locker room, and I, I think I might have said it to Lawrence Taylor. I go, why is everybody around Sean Landetta's locker and getting on him so much? He, he, he couldn't help but the punt was blocked. And I remember all the players looking at me, go, you don't know? And I said, no, I don't know. He whipped it. Sean Landetta's whiff symbolized a giant blown opportunity and foreshadowed an off-season of uncertainty. In March of 1986, Lawrence Taylor's drug problems first became public. Embarrassed by the negative publicity, Taylor tried to take matters into his own hands. Three days after that story came out, I left rehab and tried to rehab on the golf course. Taylor's golf game did little to improve his ongoing drug problem. Luckily, Bill was with me that 86 season and helped me. There was a little bit of a sentiment, particularly in the media in New York, that we just kind of swept this stuff with Lawrence under the rug, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. We were trying pretty hard to, to stay on top of everything. In the 1986 season opener, Taylor was still in no shape to regain his title as the most feared defensive player in football. I remember it, we played a lot of plays. The, the, the defense was on the field a lot of plays. Ahead by four in the final minutes, Taylor was spent the Giants needing one last stop to seal the victory. Herschel Walker ran right past him for the winning score. I just let him walk in there. I was tired. I was tired. Um, it wasn't pretty. Coach Parcells looks at Lawrence and goes, you know, Taylor... I'm going to just have to change your name. And Lawrence, yeah, what's that? He knows it's coming. He goes, I'm just going to change your name to what's the matter with? Because every reporter, that's all they want to know. What's the matter with Lawrence? Bill, I thought he, he guy was arrogant. I mean, he, he was... He was just, he was just cocky, and, 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 and he was, he was crude. I mean, and cruel and all that. I think Lawrence's personality and my personality really are somewhat alike in the respect that we pretty much say what we're thinking. Hey, Sula, you better hope I never get back in there. I will kick your ass. What the are you doing staying 10 yards in the backfield? Get up on the line. Don't you know how much time's on the clock? And every day he was on my butt of the LT. I don't care if I, I could never do nothing right. Oh, LT on the inside. Look at this. 
once in a while there was a confrontation, and really not that many. Some of these guys got to get their head out of their ass around here. I told him, man, listen, hey, you're going to, and you're going to have to either get somebody else in here to play my position, trade me, uh, or put me on the bench or something, but you got to get the hell off my back. And, and after that, we had a, a good relationship. I mean, a, a great relationship as a, a coach and a player. In 1986, Taylor rebounded from his disappointing start to have the best season by a linebacker in NFL history. He finished the year with 20 and a half sacks and won the league's most valuable player award. Three weeks after the loss to Dallas, with the Giants now two and one, Taylor's return to greatness began to take shape. His reemergence solidified the defense, but the offense was crumbling. The Giants trailed 17 to nothing, and tight end Mark Bavaro had broken his jaw. Of course, they took him away for an x-ray, and he came back, and he had his teeth kind of gritted. So he couldn't talk, and he was like this, and kind of punched me in the back and went, you know, I'm ready to go. In what would be a season full of heroic comebacks, Bavaro returned and led the Giants to victory. How you doing, kid? Uh, oh, boy, I'm proud of you. Tough guy, kid. And Mark didn't miss any games with that broken jaw. It was wired together, and he was eating his cereal out of a straw for the next couple of weeks, but we went forward from there. Midway through the 1986 season, the Giants' identity was clear. They possessed a dominant defense and a run-oriented offense powered by Joe Morris. That combination was enough to improve their record to 6-2 and two, and overcome a passing game that was mired in a prolonged slump. We got to a point, we were awful. We couldn't complete passes. We couldn't get it down the field at all. The player who received the brunt of the blame for the Giants passing rows was the team's struggling quarterback. You try not to read the bad things in the paper, but you can't help when the headline says Giants will never win as long as Sims is quarterback. Oh, there it is. You see it. I tell you, I wish that Sims had just come out there and get hot, hit about eight in a damn row. Yeah. That's going to be tough on him tonight. All uh, right. We can do something against these guys. In the rematch with Dallas, Sims hit his lowest point of the season. The Giants won the game thanks to another strong defensive effort. But Sims suffered one of the worst performances of his career, and the home fans turned against him. I knew they were booing me, and uh, that's just the way it is for a quarterback. But um, it was hard. Everywhere you go, you feel the animosity towards you. How do you react when fans say that, well, Phil Sims is responsible for a lot of these little bobbles we're having? Well, I handle the ball more, more than anybody else, so of course I'm going to be in the center of everything that just about goes wrong. And I'm not going to sit here and try to defend myself or whatever. I prepare and play, and I play pretty well. I'm not saying I'm the greatest quarterback in the NFL, but... Uh, if the Giant team can win, it can win with me, and I know that. The Giants were 7-2. and two. And although Sims may not have won many games with his play, his resolve had won over one of his harshest critics. Bill Sims is really quite a, a unique guy. He tries to do everything he can to, to ensure the success of the team. He's very unselfish. I think it's important that the rest of the team know that the quarterback is a fighter, and uh, Phil Sims is a fighter. Well, there's so many things I can say about Bill Parcells. You know, first off, I, I wish I would have listened even more. I was just mad all the time, no matter what went on. Uh, 
we got to get something going here now. Damn, we know it. Let's go. Phil would never cross the line with me as a coach, but he would go right to the edge. Phil, look, when we call the, t the, the wide head, that's who we're trying to throw to. I, I, Bill, don't don't they, be too inventive, okay? Okay, they took him. They're covering him. I know, I okay, saw it. They're, they're just going they're covering over him. the last time? Yeah, too. yeah. Just, all right, I'll see what I'm doing. I'm not proud of some of our blow-ups. And, and, you know, in fact, it... It makes me a little sad. I wish I wouldn't have said some of those things. There was no reason to act the way I did sometimes. And to get your fat ass off Shut the up, floor. Sims. Now, don't be a damn no hey, class player. Who's going to hear me? What I'm just saying it. Let's go. But, you know, he kind of he taught me to be that way. Tell that undisciplined center we got to get his head mm -hmm. out of his ass. It's about 10 today. All right, 40 seconds here. Unbelievable. Here I am coming to the sideline during the game, and I'd be. 10 yards from him, he'd go, shut the up. You can play, I'll can coach. You got it? I understood that. Hey, Phil, I'll run the game. I, know, I don't know who you're sending in. I'm sending goal line in, well, Somebody give me something. Okay. I ain't got time to make Signal. a call. It was unbelievable, the timeouts. It was a minute of getting cursed at. All I can say is, I'm so glad I had the experience to play for him. And there's never, I really mean it, there's never a day that goes by where I don't try to put some wisdom on somebody. And I quote him because I remember them all and because they're all so true. Before the week 11 game with the Vikings, Parcells offered some advice to his embattled quarterback. His words did not come out of anger, but out of respect and serve to inspire Sims for the rest of the season. I said, I don't know what you're thinking, but here's what I'm thinking. You got your team in first place. I said, you just beat your three biggest division rivals three weeks in a row. I said, don't pay any attention to what they're saying. Just go out there and play, and don't let that media affect you as far as trying to be a daring quarterback. You just go out there and let it go, and I will support you 100% no matter what happens. Can you imagine in this day and age a coach saying to their quarterback as he's walking out of the locker room, take some chances. I don't care if you throw four interceptions. Just keep throwing it down. You know, coach now, they, you know, they get down and genuflect and, oh, don't have a turnover and, you know, oh my God, you know, it, it's incredible to listen to some of these guys now. But Bill... Just saying, the words he gave me, told me during that week, made me feel better, and that was the end of the tailspin of our passing game. Against the Vikings, Sims completed 25 passes for over 300 yards. But it's his last throw that will live in giant lore. The play was Half right W motion, 74 X in. So uh, I, it's pretty vivid in my mind. As we were getting ready to break the huddle, I said to Bobby Johnson, Bobby, be alert. I might have to come to you late. Fourth and 17, 10 drop back to the 40. Sam's the kinds of plays that turn seasons around and to Phil's credit he stood in there and waited till the last minute and took a pretty good thump the pass led to a game-winning field goal and the quarterback who had already won over the coach had now won over the team from that time on I felt that if we're going to win a championship or we're going to excel as a team is going to be behind the arm of Phil Sims, and he became my man right then. Week 12 of the 1986 season marked a Super Bowl preview. The Giants got their first glimpse of quarterback John Elway. On this day, the Broncos' young star would be upstaged by the oldest member of the Giants. Defensive end, George Martin. 
George Martin's play was one of the greatest plays I've ever seen in football. It was at the end of a pretty sustained drive by Denver. He was very tired at the time, physically. I didn't think the old man was going to get all the way down. So I said, hey, 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 flip it over here. 45 at the 45, Elway takes it and breaks the tackle. He started the lateral to him. I'm like, I'm right here. Come on, give it to me. And then I thought he was dead right here. He was dead. But being the great athlete he is, he goes in and, and scores. beating one future Hall of Fame quarterback. The Giants traveled to San Francisco to face another. Joe Montana staked the 49ers to a 17 to nothing halftime lead. And I remember coming in at halftime and Bill Parcells was already in there and I could see the look on his face. Sims, we could do this. And I'd I, I never seen him in this kind of mood. It was like, we're so close. Let's make this thing finally happen. And wouldn't you know it, the second play of the second half is to throw to Mark Bavaro. Complete to Bavaro, down to the 35. Still on his feet to the 30. Down to the 25. Down to the 20. He's got four men on his back and gets down to the 17. I don't respect anybody in the league more than I have respected Ronnie Lott. And you see, Bavaro dragging Ronnie Lott's like, yeah. Those kinds of things don't happen very often. That was a very inspiring play for our whole team. Sims threw for a season-high 388 yards, and the Giants came back to win 21-17. to Things like that happen, then you know you're good enough to do it. The Giants needed only to defeat Washington to clinch their first-ever NFC East title. I loved going down there and playing at RFK. The atmosphere, it was awesome. And we're walking out in 1986 to play down there late in the year. The fans let us have it. They were good. They could say things. You go, wow, that was creative. And Bill Parcells was next to me going out for warm-ups. And he goes, you know what, Sims? They hate us so much here, they like us. Playing at Washington had added significance for Virginia native Lawrence Taylor. Washington Redskins just have to be my father's favorite team. I always like to do something a little special, playing the Redskins. Taylor unleashed his most impressive performance of the season and single-handedly destroyed the Redskins offense. The Giants won the game and the division. Afterward, their coach offered a rare display of approval and his thoughts on the future. I think the Redskins got a very good team. And I got a funny feeling that we're going to meet them somewhere down the road again uh, before the 86 season's over. I just thought we played pretty well today. And uh, I'm, where's Peter King? I'm proud of my guys, Peter. <laughs> to clinch home field advantage throughout the playoffs, the Giants needed to beat the lowly Packers in the season finale. The Giants led 24 to nothing before the Packers stormed back to close within seven by halftime. I think in my coaching career, the most upset I've ever been with a team was at that moment. So I went down to the offense and I told them that if we scored 45 points in this game, we might be able to tie the game. I walked down to the defense and I grabbed the week's 55 gallon plastic barrel we had with the tape and the orange juice and the Gatorade bottles and everything that was in there for the week. And I pulled it out and I started dumping it on top of these guys and I said, you guys belong here with the rest of this, I guess I can say, okay? And then I threw the barrel off the back wall of the meeting room and I left. 
<laughs> he is such a baby. Mm -hmm. I, uh, he pouts every, I mean, he pouts all the time. He pouts, 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 pouts. I mean, and that season, he's always pouting. Stop pouting, man. We're going to win. Let's go. Now, I'm quite sure I'm built through garbage. He ain't throwing it in my direction. <laughs> the offense did not score 45 points. They scored 55. The defense shut down the Packers. And team captain Harry Carson determined it was now Parcells' turn to get dumped on. And about five or six of them said, what are we now, Bill? What, tell, tell us what we are now. Are we, are we still horse or are we, are we, we regular or are we just horse or what are we? And that went on and on. Because by the time I got in and said the team prayer, now the whole team was kind of harping on it a little bit. And where, where should we go? Should we go right into the, the garbage or should we change and go to the shop? So it kind of took on a life of its own. But hey, those are some of the great days that I remember. Before the Giants' playoff game with the 49ers, Bill Parcells directed his sarcastic jabs at the offensive line. We had gone to San Francisco in that comeback game. We'd only managed to make 13 yards rushing. So I started calling them Club 13. Club 13, oh, it was awesome. You know, I loved it. You know, I loved it when he picked on the offensive line because I knew that was going to be a better week for me. After being beat up by Parcells, Club 13 set out to punish the 49ers' defensive line. Let's go, Joe. All right, guys. I can remember it like it's yesterday. Handing it off to Joe Morris early in the game. And as I'd hand it off, I'd turn around and watch, and I'd go, oh, man, we are whipping them big time up front. Sims benefited from great protection and threw four touchdowns. His counterpart, Joe Montana, wasn't nearly as fortunate. Close wildly, intercepted! There goes Tyler down to the 20! touchdown! LT! LT! Way to go! That was just a good old-fashioned ass-whipping we gave him. The Giants trounced the 49ers and advanced to the NFC Championship game. The only team blocking their path to the Super Bowl was their division rival, the Washington Redskins. Bill, you acknowledge that you might see the Redskins down the road. Does the thought of that scare you? Let me tell you what I'm scared of. I'm scared of spiders, snakes, uh, and the IRS. Not the Redskins. Well, you know, they're in our league. It's competition. I look forward to that. Parcell's biggest worry was not lining up against the Redskins, but rather facing the 40-mile-per-hour winds of the Meadowlands. We won the toss. And uh, the last thing you want to do is give a team that you think you got a chance to beat at home a little momentum. So I said, OK, we're going to defend a certain end. And that end is going to have the win behind us for the first quarter. And with that decision, the tone of the game was set. The Redskins' offense never found its mark. The Giants' offense soared early and cruised the rest of the way. I remember one of the best performances I've ever seen in professional football that day. Sean Lindetta punting the football. He rebounded from the whiff of 85. He was kicking 45 yarders right through the wind. And the punter for the Washington Redskins, he's kicking it. They can't even get it in the air, and they're going about 15 yards. And it was a huge part of our victory. Unbelievably, a punter was the key to the victory of that game. Three weeks earlier, the coach dumped garbage on the players in disgust. Now the fans showered the players with garbage in a celebration. In three seasons, 
the Giants had gone from winning three games to playing in the biggest game of all. Going to the Super Bowl, I just thought, man, that's for other people. That's not for people like me. And I think when it was finally over, I thought, wow. So going to the Super Bowl is not just for the superstars like Joe Montana. I'm going to get a chance to go there. I don't have to motivate this team for this game. Are you kidding? This is the Super Bowl. If you can't get ready to play this game, you ought to take a hike. We were practicing so well. Bill, one day, he's all excited, and he goes, that's it. Oh, that's it. Save something for the game. Let's, let's be careful. Let's don't, let's don't leave it all. And I was, like, looking at him going, this, all right, what's wrong with you? Because, you know, he's always screaming in practice, do it better. That stinks. You stink. A week that was already strange then became surreal. Disney. The company that promotes itself as the place where dreams come true approached Sims to be part of a new advertising campaign should he win the Super Bowl MVP. You know what they say, dreams are better when you share them. I said no to it all week. Uh, John Elway had agreed to it. I said, oh, no, I can't do that. That is messing with football gods, the karma of the game. And, you know, Bill Parcells constantly preached to us, careful what you say, you know, don't seek glory, don't be this, don't be an eye guy, all this. And, you know, I really believed in that. In the first half, Sims remained in the background, while Elway positioned himself to play the commercial's starring role. Late in the second quarter, the Broncos led 10-7 to and had first and goal at the one. The former linebacker's coach needed a stop, and the crew he once molded delivered. That's when the, the great players make plays. Taylor made one, Carson was in on one, and then Banks made another one. And then, by some stroke of luck, they missed the field goal. So we went in, really outplayed very badly the first half. We're only down one point. I told them at the half, I said, you know, we got a good chance to win this now. We can't play that bad. Okay, now offense, we're getting the ball. And we're going to run and pass the ball down the field right now. More importantly, things start going a little rough. You better pull together. Pull together. It's a team, man. It's a team. One guy can't do it. It takes all of us. On the opening drive of the second half, Parcells jump-started the turnaround by calling a fake punt option on fourth and one. Jeff Rutledge had the choice to run a sneak if the Broncos failed to set up to defend against him. Jeff looked over there and he was trying to look at me. And I, I just kind of nodded my head to him. And that means go ahead with it. And he did it. After Rutledge got the first down, Parcell's next call was for Sims to pass the Giants to a championship. I didn't have any sense that it was going to be 22 for 25 with two drop passes. He really was spectacular that day. Sims led the Giants to scores on five straight second-half possessions in one of the best performances by a quarterback in Super Bowl history. His final touchdown confirmed. On this night, Phil Simms could do no wrong. I looked up the scoreboard. I said, we've won the Super Bowl. 
It's over. It's, we have now won. Sims knew the touchdown had clinched the game. But his coach wasn't quite ready to forget about the play before. He goes, come here, come here, come here. I think he's going to come over and he's going to say, Phil, you were great. You are great. And he goes, now look, Sims, you can't take a sack in that situation. And I go, who gives a <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Sims could no longer be described as the quarterback who would never lead his team to a championship. Now his title was Super Bowl MVP. That moment, being an MVP, I didn't realize it was that big. I really didn't. It just, I didn't think that way. And uh, if I'd have known all that, if I'd have known it was such a big deal, and I, hell, I, I, I might not have got it done. I don't know. So we are best in the world, man, for one year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Terrific. What am I supposed to say? I'm going to I'm Disney going to Walt Disney World okay. and okay. Disneyland. Okay. It's a chase that's exciting. You build up to this big game, the big, the, the, uh, and once it's over, it's like, okay, what we do now? Well, let's go out and party, but everybody's tired. <laughs> too tired to go out and party too long. Bill Parcells knew how he wanted to celebrate the Giants' first championship in 30 years. The coach who grew up a Giants fan and had listened to the 1958 championship on the radio asked his players to give him the ride of a lifetime. I didn't want this ride to be very long. I wanted it to be kind of a short ride, and then that was it. But they, they carried me and kept going, and it was, I couldn't get down. I'm going to go to Disney World. I'm going to go to Disneyland. I'm going to go to Disney World. I'm going to go to Disneyland, yeah, brother. As I'm saying, I'm going to Disney World, I'm thinking, God, I hope Coach doesn't see me do this. <laughs> Again? Huh? I'm going to go to Disneyland. All these people thinking, what the f is he doing? <laughs> Bill, take it away. The only performance by Sims that Parcells acknowledged was the one that made the Giants champions. I'd just like to say that I think that that ought to dispel uh, any myth about Phil Simms because I'll tell you, he was absolutely not Memphis. The great Phil Simms. You have to preface it with the great Phil Simms. He was just a, really an unconquerable guy. No matter what you did to him, no matter what kind of beating that he took, he was getting you the next time. But Phil and Lawrence and... You know, I, I can't name them all, but the Carsons, Martins, Burts, Bavaros, Carthons, Bankses, those are the guys that that propelled Bill Parcells. There are 20 or 30 of those guys that that I wouldn't have had a chance with without them. Hey, what's what's up, up, Listen, the rest of your life, the rest of your life, I'm man, tip. nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did it. Yeah. Yeah. Nine seasons after winning the Super Bowl, the Giants retired Phil Simms' jersey. I knew I had to say a few words out there, and I didn't want to just make a speech. I, just, I really didn't want to say anything, say, thank you, and I want to throw one more pass, and that's what all I want to do. Phil and myself, we'd had some, we'd had some, some problems prior to that, you know, uh, personality-wise, and, and we weren't really, we weren't talking. We weren't speaking. I mean, we I hadn't I hadn't talked to to Phil at that time in in probably a couple of years. Thank you. Should I put it on? But when they was going to do his ceremony, I said, "Well, I'm gonna come to that. I I, I need to be there." Well, right before the game started in the tunnel, I see Lawrence 
I, I came up to Phil and I said con congratulations and stuff. And we hugged each other, man. We hugged each other for about five minutes, after, you know, because you know we both knew that 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 what we had meant to each other, I guess, you know, over the, over the the course of the battles we had gone through. And um, he said, man, I want you to come out to uh, on the field with me. I said, yeah, of course I'll come out with you, right? I wanted, I wanted to, throw to throw one more, one more pass, pass in my giant jersey. jersey. So. Oh. Who better to catch that pass than the greatest giant player of all, Lawrence Taylor? I'm like, okay, all right. And I got flip flops on, and I, you know, I had a couple beers. I remember him hugging me and going, "Man, make sure it's a good pass." Straight down the field, real easy. Yeah. All of a sudden, it kind of hit me. I put Lawrence in a really tough spot. National TV. He's got dress shoes and a sports jacket on, and he's had a few beers. He's going to run down the field, and I'm going to throw him a pass. Go! I stepped off about 10 yards like this, and he looked at me and said, no, 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 go. I said, go? I mean, like, you mean actually, no, he wants me to run. And so I saw trying to uh, run down the field, and I thought he was going to throw me like a little end cut. But no, he's still padding. He wants me to keep going, keep going. And he throws this big old bomb down the field. I'm saying to myself, if I drop this pass, I got to run my black ass all the way back <laughs> to upper side of the river because I say, ain't no way I'm going to be able to stay in that stadium. Hey. But he came through as he always did. People don't understand what winning a championship does. Winning a championship will put you together forever. It's like a blood transfer. You get their blood and they've got your blood. And when you think about that time, you can't do it without thinking of those people. That Super Bowl, what it's done for my life and some of the thoughts I have about football, it, it does give me a, a, an unbelievable feeling of satisfaction that I was part of a team that won a championship. I think about it all the time. I think about my teammates' memories. They, they last forever. And really, as I get older, they become sweeter and they mean more to me. I've played on 13 different teams, but that 86 team, those guys mean more to, you know, more to us than, they mean more to me personally than, than, the, um, than all the other teams put together. Put together. If that's not what this is supposed to be about, then what is? What is it supposed to be about? Because that really was a team, and they're still a team, and they, they count on one another to this day. <laughs>